Good morning again, everyone. It's good to see you this morning. It's been a wonderful day of worship to our God. And we are especially happy to have people here who are visiting with our church family. If you are a guest here with us this morning, we are so happy that you're here. We hope that you'll take out your Bible with us right now and study with us from the Word of God for the next few minutes. You know, among the many things, among the many things we're blessed to have here at this congregation, the Monta Vista Church of Christ, one of the blessings that I'm especially grateful for are the families. I'm grateful for your family. I'm grateful that here at Monta Vista, we are blessed to have so many wonderful and beautiful families. We have families on this side of the building here, and we have families over here, and we got families towards the back of the building. We're blessed to have families all over this place. And let me just ask a question to all of the families this morning. For all the families here this morning, what I want to know, I want to know what kind of family do you have? What kind of family do you have right here and right now today? If you provided me with one statement that could really sum up your family, what would it be? Would it be that you are a sports family? Would it be that you are an athletic family or a social family or a travel family or an intellectual family? Or a family that is first and foremost about making good grades and hitting the books and having high ACT and SAT scores so your kids can get into the best colleges? What about this right here? What about being a God first family? What about being a family that is first and foremost about God? I mean, does that describe your family right now? Does that statement really kind of sum up what you and your family are all about while you may have a family that is heavily involved in sports and academics and being very social and there's nothing wrong with that? Is your family, though, still first and foremost about God? Do you have a God first family? I submit that right here, right now, you can know you can know if you have this type of family. Right here and right now, you can know if you have a God first family. It's very simple. A family that is first and foremost about God consists of a husband and a wife who truly love God and allow him to rule completely in their marriage. They do everything that God requires of them in their marriage. They read their Bibles together. They pray together. They're faithful to each other. They constantly talk about God and his wonderful love and attributes, and they do those things with their children. If they're blessed to have children, from the time their children are very small, a God-first couple will start teaching them about God. They'll start teaching them right away that God is the creator of all things and he loves them and watches over them and, and he holds them accountable for their behavior. They also attend Bible classes together as a family. And they worship God together as a family. In fact, they make worshiping God our priority all the time. They make worshiping God something that comes before sports and social events, and school stuff, and worshiping God is even something that they do while on vacation. They also hold one another accountable to righteous and godly living every single day. They're also kind to each other. And they're forgiving towards one another, and they're patient with one another, and they're loving towards one another. They do everything that God says that a family must do. That is a God-first family. And I ask again, do you have a family like that? Are you part of a family like that? Are you part of a God-first family? 
I believe that that is a good question for us to consider. Since we have reached the final stage in the family portion of our Hand to Plow sermon series for 2022. For those of you who are members of this congregation, the Monte Vista Church of Christ, you know that like we did with the three sermons about the field of the heart in the months of February, March, and April in the month of May, we began talking about a different field. We, be we began talking about the field of the family, right? We began talking about how to plant proper seed in our family and how to secure and cultivate that seed by making sure that we connect with God with our family and connect with members of our family and connect with brothers and sisters in Christ. And this morning, we're going to talk about we're going to talk about the final stage in the process. We're going to talk about the fruit. We're going to talk about the produce. We're going to talk about the produce and the blessing of having a God first family when we do all the different kinds of things that we've been talking about for the last couple of months. You see, if we do the kind of things that we've been talking about in the months of May and June, the produce from that, the result of that is going to be a God first family. It's going to be a family that is first and foremost about God and his son, Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. You see, that kind of family, a God first family has the potential to impact so many different kinds of people. For example, a God-first family has the potential to impact the children. It has the potential to impact our children. Again, here at Monte Vista, we're blessed to have so many, so many children. A lot of congregations are blessed in that way. We're blessed to have children here. We have children as young as a few days old, all the way to seniors in high school. We got a couple of others on the way. We got a bunch of children all throughout this congregation. And I'm pretty sure that when it comes to all the parents of those beautiful children, we, we all want the same thing, right? As parents, we all want the same things for our children. The main thing we want for our children is we want our children to serve Jesus, right? We want them to love Jesus, to fear Jesus, to do the things that Jesus wants them to do. We want them to eventually grow up and be, grow up and become strong soldiers of Jesus Christ and go to heaven to be with him for eternity. That's what I want for my kids. And I know that's what you want for your kids. And while there's no way we can guarantee that outcome for our kids, one of the things that a God first family does is it provides them with the best chance. It provides them with the best opportunity to become what we want them to become spiritually. That's what Moses told the Israelite parents all the way back in Deuteronomy chapter 6. I'm going to ask you to go in your Bible, please, to Deuteronomy chapter 6. I know we've been considering those passages for quite a bit over the past couple of months, but let's consider them one more time for the purpose of this lesson. We're going to Deuteronomy chapter 6, please. And look at verse number four. We're listening to what Moses, the man of God, the prophet of God, what he said to the Israelite parents not long before the people of Israel would finally be blessed by God to conquer the land of Canaan. In Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning with verse number 4, Moses has some things he wanted these parents to understand. He said in verse number 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might, with every fiber of your being. Verse number six, these words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Verse seven, you shall teach them diligently to your sons. And you should talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down and when you rise up. You should buy them as a sign on your hand and they should be as frontals on your forehead. You should write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. Notice what Moses is saying here to the people of God. Notice how as he rehearses the will of God for his people, he emphasizes here the need for them to develop and maintain God first families. Moses is talking about God first families in those passages. According to Moses, God first families are families who put God first, not just some of the time, but all the time. 
All the time they're about God. All the time they're about thinking about the law of God and talking about God and teaching God's will and studying it with their children. This is something that the Apostle Paul echoes when we get to a New Testament passage like Ephesians 6 and verse 4. Ephesians 6 and verse 4, fathers, notice that language. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Here, the Apostle Paul, the Apostle Paul is doing the same thing as Moses. The Apostle Paul is talking about God first families. He is saying that God first families are led by God first men. They're led by God first fathers. They're led by fathers who put God first with their children. They're led by fathers who put God and his word as a priority with their children over sports and, and fun and even academics. They're led by fathers who use the limited amount of time they have with their children in the home to influence them to put God where he belongs. And that is at the very core and center of their hearts. I submit that when children grow up in a setting like that, when they grow up in a family like that, it's going to impact them. It's going to impact them in some powerful, powerful ways. For example, this kind of family, a God first family will impact our children's character. We talked about character this morning, didn't we? Brother Brian talked about character. Well, here we see that character matters also. It matters to our children. When we have God first families, it's going to impact their, their character. It's going to help them develop the right kind of character. It's going to help them develop character like Jesus. Character that is moral and, and kind and unselfish and different and leads them to making good decisions, even in a society that is drifting further and further away from God, like the society we're living in today. You see, a God first family will impact the morality and the character of our kids. And many of you know that firsthand. Many of you are very moral and godly people. You have godly character. You have righteous character because your parents started teaching you that kind of character from the Bible from the time you were very small, right? That stood with you through the rest of your life. That's what a God first family can do. It can impact a young person's character for the rest of their lives. And it can also impact their priorities. It can also impact where they position God in their lives. It can impact what they're going to do when they go off to college and Wednesday night rolls around and they have a big test the next morning. What are they going to do in that situation? What have we taught them to do in that situation? Are they going to stay in and keep studying for that test? Or will they go to Bible class and stay up a little extra that night to prepare for that test? What are they going to do in that situation? Where are their priorities? If, you have ever, if you've ever spent an entire week at Disney World in Orlando, and, and some of you have, if you've ever done that before, then it's very likely that you have visited the Fortune Road Church of Christ in Kissimmee. You ever been to the Fortune Road Church of Christ in Kissimmee? A lot of Christians attend that congregation whenever they're going to Disney World in Orlando. If you've been there before, then maybe you've met the preacher. The preacher there, his name is Mark Copeland. Mark Copeland's been a dear friend of mine for quite some time, and I can remember when I was preaching down in Florida several years ago, we were having dinner together. I think it was at Bob Evans or something, and he he told me something very personal. He told me something about his childhood. He, he told me something powerful that he remembered from his childhood. He told me that when he was a young boy, he liked sports, just like my son likes sports. He loved sports. He didn't love basketball, but he loved baseball. He was on the baseball team, and whenever there was a game that took place on a Sunday evening or a Wednesday night, his father, his father who passed away recently, his father made sure that he wasn't there. 
He wasn't at those games. No matter how much the coach complained about it, no matter how much his teammates griped about it, he was not going to be at a practice on a Sunday evening or a practice on a Wednesday night. And you know why that was the case? The reason that was the case was because his father was trying to teach him something. He was trying to teach him about priorities. He was trying to teach him from a very young age to never put anything over God. You never put sports over God. You never put baseball over God and growing in God. Mark Copeland, who's a faithful gospel preacher and an elder in the church, he told me that he remembers vividly his father teaching him that lesson from the time he was a small boy and that has stood with him for the rest of his life. That impacted his priorities and where he put God for the rest of his life. God first families can impact the priorities of children. It can help them develop proper priorities and it can impact how they view Christianity. It, it, it can show them from a very young age that Christianity is not something we just do on Sunday. It's not something we just do when we come here and we take the Lord's Supper and we sing these songs and we give money and we come back together on Wednesday night to have a Bible class. No, 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 no. Our children need to understand that Christianity, that is something that is part of our identity. I am a Christian. I'm a disciple. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ and I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. Not just when I come into this building. I try to follow Jesus all the time. That's who I am. That's my identity. And if we are wise with our time, we can start teaching our children that from the time they're very small, they need to understand very early that Christianity is something we do 24 seven. It is part of who we are. It is something that we do all the time. And then think about this. Think about how God first families can ultimately impact the children, our children's faith, even if they happen to lose their faith later on down the line. When you go in your Bible, please, to the book of Proverbs, I want to show you a familiar passage in Proverbs. You're probably very familiar with this passage, and I want to make some comments about it, please. In Proverbs chapter 22 and verse number 6. In Proverbs chapter 22 and in verse number 6, Solomon, the wise man, wrote these words. He said in verse 6, Train up a child, and the way that he should go, even when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, for us to really be able to appreciate a verse like that and not panic when we read a verse like that, I think it's important that we pause and remember what the Proverbs are. Brothers and sisters, the Proverbs are just that. They're Proverbs. They are general truths. They are not absolutes. They are not guarantees. There is no guarantee that as parents, if we do everything we're supposed to do, if we bring our kids to church, if we bring them to every Bible class, if we make sure they go to FC camps and, and we study with them and we pray with them and we help them pick good friends, there's no guarantee that if we do all that stuff and so much more, they're going to remain faithful to God. There's no guarantee of that. They're free moral agents. They'll have to make their decision at some point whether or not they're going to serve Jesus without our supervision. Right now, my kids come to church because I make them come. They live with me. I make them come. But there's going to come a time, Lord willing, when they're going to have to make that decision themselves. This decision about Jesus will have to fall in their lap, and they're going to have to decide what they're going to do with it. This passage is not guaranteeing the faithfulness of our children, but what it is saying is if we have God-first families, if we train up our children the right way, it will give them some roots. It will give them a foundation. It will give them some early direction. It would put within their conscience something that may eat at them and bring them back to the Lord if they happen to fall away down the line. I believe that is what Solomon is saying there. And for the parents here who have prodigals, for the parents in this room that I love so much and respect so much, and you have children who have left the Lord, let the words of Solomon encourage you. Let those words build you up. Let them give you hope. Let them remind you that you did not labor in vain having a God-first family. 
a God first family will impact our kids. But not only will it impact our kids, let's also point out how they will impact the church. Particularly, they'll impact the local church. Go in your Bible, please, to Acts chapter 2. We are beginning this week our reading of the book of Acts, and I'm so excited about the book of Acts. I know you hear preachers say this all the time. This book's my favorite book. That book's my favorite book. You probably heard me say every book of the New Testament is my favorite book, but I really mean it this time. Acts is my favorite book in the New Testament. And I'm going to Acts chapter 2, and you remember in Acts chapter 2, in Acts chapter 2, after Peter preached this powerful sermon about Jesus and he told the people to repent and be baptized, in verse number 41 it says, so then those who have received his word, verse 41, so then those who have received his word were baptized, and that day there were added about 3,000 souls. So notice how the church begins with 3,000 people. That's a lot of people. But look at chapter 4 and verse 4. Just two chapters over in chapter 4 and verse 4. It says, but many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of men came to be about 5,000. Now that word men you see there comes from the same Greek word that you found back in Luke, in Luke chapter 9, when it talked about 5,000 men that Jesus multiplied bread for, not talking about gene in the generic sense, talking about adult males. Adult males. There are 5,000 adult males in the church by this time. That's not counting women and children who also are disciples. Could have been as many as 15 or 20,000 people in the church at Jerusalem at this time. But now look at Acts chapter 8 and verse 4. Look at Acts. In fact, let's start with verse number three. After the death of Stephen, one of the first deacons in the church, in Acts chapter 8 and verse number three, the Bible says, but Saul, this is Saul of Tarsus, who will later go on to become the apostle Paul. Saul of Tarsus began ravaging the church, entering, notice, house after house and dragging off men and women, and he put them in prison. Now look at verse four. Therefore, those who have been scattered went about preaching the word. So notice how the church is growing and it's growing and it's growing. You've got thousands of people in the church. And Saul of Tarsus tries to destroy the church. He starts persecuting the church. He, he forces Christians to leave the city of Jerusalem. Now, here's my question. Are we to believe that only adults were involved in what this verse is saying? Are we to believe that only single Christians or only Christians who were who were married, who were couples, were forced out of Jerusalem at this time? Of course not. Of course, in addition to single Christians and, and Christian couples, there were also families forced out of Jerusalem. There were also families like the families in this room who were forced to leave their homes and leave Jerusalem due to persecution, and yet these Christians continued to do evangelism. They continued to spread the word of God. They did even with their families. If families were involved in evangelism 2,000 years ago, in fact, beyond evangelism, look at Acts chapter 21, please. Look over at Acts chapter 21. And listen to what the Bible says here as the Apostle Paul is traveling with Luke on his way to Jerusalem with this contribution for the needy saints. It says in Luke chapter 21 and look at verse number four. In verse four, after looking up the disciples, Luke says, we stayed there seven days and they kept telling Paul through the spirit not to set foot in Jerusalem. When our days were ended, we left and started on our journey while they all, now look at this, with wives and children. Wives and children escorted us until we were out of the city. After kneeling down on the beach and praying, we said farewell to one another. Then we went on board the ship, and they, the families, returned home again. Look at verse 7. When we had finished the voyage from Tyre, we arrived at Ptolemus, and after greeting the brethren, we stayed with them for a day. On the next day, we left and came to Caesarea and entering the house of Philip the Evangelist. This is the same Philip who preached to the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip the evangelist, who was one of the seven, we stayed with him. Now, this man had four virgin daughters who were prophetesses. And as we were staying there for some days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. So notice in these verses here, we find 
families, God first families impacting the local church beyond evangelism. We find them in verses four through six, encouraging people, encouraging the apostle Paul, encouraging Luke, encouraging preachers of the gospel. And then in verses seven through 10, we find God first families engaging in hospitality. That's what Philip and his four virgin daughters who were prophetesses did. They are doing God's work as a family. Now go to Acts chapter 14. Look at Acts the 14th chapter, verse 23. And Acts the 14th chapter in verse 23. The Bible says, when they had appointed elders for them in every church, having prayed with fasting, they committed them to the Lord and whom they believed. So notice how 2,000 years ago, local churches were looking just like this church. They had elders. They had elders. They had men who were shepherding the flock of God. They had pastors, men who were leading the people of God. Now, here's my question. What is one of the key things necessary for a church to have, which you find in verse number 23? What is one of the key things that is necessary for a local church to have qualified leadership, to have elders? Where according to what we find in 1 Timothy chapter 3 and in Titus chapter 1, if you're going to have qualified men to be elders in the church, then you've got to have men with families. You've got to have men who have God first families. You've got to have men who have wives who love the Lord and who have children who love the Lord. What I want you to see is throughout the book of Acts, we find God first families impacting the church. They are impacting the local church, and that same thing needs to be going on today. That same thing needs to be going on even here at the Monta Vista Church of Christ. You see, just like we find here in Acts, here at Monta Vista, God first families can have a tremendous impact on what we're trying to do. God first families can impact our Bible classes. God first families can make our Bible classes dynamic and exciting and edifying for people of all ages. God first families can impact evangelism. They can impact our spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout the valley. I mean, what a wonderful thing it would be if every family in this church was involved in studying the gospel with other families in their neighborhoods and in their community. I mean, don't you think we would be making some serious noise if we had every family doing that kind of stuff? And what about the worship assemblies? What about what we've been doing for the past couple of hours? I mean, do you think God first families can impact the edification of a worship assembly. I don't know about you, but I am so encouraged. And I'm so edified when I see families sitting in the pew together on the Lord's Day and they're turning to the scriptures and they're taking notes and they are praying together and giving together and singing loud together. That kind of stuff really fires me up. That makes me excited about being a Christian. That makes me excited about being part of this congregation, the Monta Vista Church of Christ. And then think about the future of this church. Think about how like we, we read about here in Acts chapter 14, if we want to always ensure that we have qualified leadership, then we gotta have God first families. You know, right now we have qualified godly leadership. We have five men who love this church and they pray for this church and they serve this church. They shepherd this church. They lead this church to the best of their ability and they glorify God. But let me tell you something, my friends. We can't expect these men to, to live forever. We can't expect them to always be leaders in this church one day they will no longer be able to bless us with their service. But when a church has God first families all throughout it, well, then that church is equipped to have other men to step up and continue their work. Then they're equipped to have other men step up and, and be elders and deacons so the church can have, have qualified leadership for decades and decades to come. God first families can impact the church. And so I got to ask you, do we have those kind of families here? 
We got, we got God first families. Do we have families who are not just on a roll sheet or just filling a pew or not just coming in and pulling some pegs off the wall to say, yeah, I'm here today. No, do we have families who are actively involved in the work? They're doing the work. They're doing evangelism. They're offering passionate worship. They're part of the Bible classes. They're encouraging other people. They're helping ensure that this church always has godly leadership like we have right now. God first families can impact children and the local church. And thirdly, let's talk about how God first families can impact the world, the whole world beyond the church. And when we say the world, let's be clear about what we mean. We're talking about people who don't believe the things that we believe. We're talking about people who are under the grip of Satan. People who don't follow God, who don't follow Jesus Christ. No one, on, no one in his family in Genesis chapter 6, they had an impact on people like that, didn't they? Remember, in a world that caused God to grieve because they were wicked and they were constantly thinking about sinful things, Noah and his family stood out. They shined. They were a beacon of light that God used to preserve humanity. Noah and his family made an impact on the world thousands and thousands of years ago. But look back at Acts chapter 8 and verse 4 again. Look at this verse again, Acts 8 and verse 4. Therefore, those who have been scattered went about preaching the word again. Let's not make the mistake of thinking that just single adults were forced out of Jerusalem. Couples were not the only ones forced out of Jerusalem. No Christian families were forced to abandon their homes. Christian families were forced to flee from the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem was nearly barren of Christians due to the persecution led by Saul. And can you imagine the kind of impact that, that was having on the world at that time? Can you imagine what the world must have thought when they saw Christian families while on the run for their lives, continuing to preach the gospel and remain faithful to God? We would be foolish to believe that the world didn't take notice of that kind of commitment and zeal and dedication to the cause of Jesus by families. Families were having an impact. God first families were having an impact on the world 2,000 years ago, and that same thing can happen today. That same thing can happen with our families today. Just like the Christians who read about in Acts chapter 8, we also can help the world see the priority of God and the gospel with our families. Now, we may can't do that by continuing to preach the gospel because people are forcing us out of the valley, but we can do that when we're not ashamed to give God the glory for the blessings we have in our lives. We can do that when we're not ashamed to pray with our family before eating a meal at a restaurant. We can do that when we're not afraid to tell our friends, no, I'm not going fishing with you on Sunday morning. I'm not going camping with you on Sunday morning. I am not going to be at that baseball, soccer, or basketball practice on Wednesday night because me and my family, we're going to Bible class. We're going to worship God. And we can also do this when the world comes through those doors. And we greet them. And we're nice to them. And we make them feel welcomed with our family. We shake their hand. We get to know them better. We don't treat them unkind or turn our nose up at them because they may be poor or look different than us. Instead, we invite them to maybe sit with us in our family and to please come back again and worship God with us. You see, just by doing simple stuff, that's simple stuff. Just by doing simple things like that, we can impact the world. We can show the world a better way. We can show the world an example of exactly what God wants a family to be. We can convict the world, inspire the world, help the world see the impact that Jesus Christ can have on a family when that family is committed 
to obeying his gospel. Our first families can impact the world and the church. But let's close with this. Let's close with the most important thing, and that is God first families have an impact on God. They have an impact on our God. Our God is the one who created the family. You know, as I look around the room this morning and I notice all of these beautiful and amazing families that I'm blessed to stand before, I think we need to remember something. I think we need to remember who created what you see right now. I think it's important that we remember that God created the family. God created my family. God created your family. God created the family relationship. That is exactly what we learned this morning in our scripture reading in Genesis chapter 2. When we read from Genesis chapter 2 in verse number 24, when we read about God making the first man Adam and the first woman Eve and marrying them, you know what we really were reading about? We were really reading about God making the first family. God making the first family unit. You see, family is God's invention. Family is God's creation, not ours. And as God looks at our culture and our society and what they're doing to his creation, how do you think he feels about that? How do you think God feels when he notices what our culture is doing to his invention? How do you think that impacts him? How do you think that impacts him emotionally? How do you think God is impacted emotionally when he desires permanency in marriage, but over half of marriages in this country end in divorce every single year? How do you think God is impacted by same-sex marriage? How do you think God is impacted by children being raised by two fathers or two mothers instead of a mother and a father like he designed to be back in the beginning? How do you think God is impacted when he notices this family being destroyed by alcohol and adultery and abuse? I mean, I hope we can all agree that God is negatively impacted at a very high level when he notices what our culture is doing to his invention. But the main question is, is what about us? What about our families? How are our families impacting God? I want to take you to one more passage, and we're going to get ready to close. Will you go to Genesis chapter 18, please? I want to show you something in Genesis 18. You remember Abraham, the great man of God, the great man of faith. God made great promises to Abraham. And I want to show you what the Bible says God said about Abraham. In Genesis chapter 18 and verse 19. In verse 19, God said, for I have chosen him. So that he, could, he may command his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring upon Abraham what he has spoken about him. Meditate on that passage for just a second. Notice how one of the things that contributed to Abraham being the kind of man who received great favor and promises from God was how he led his family. It was how he led his wife and how he would one day lead his children. It was how he was determined to have God first place in his life and first place in his family. That's why God picked Abraham to make those promises to. God noticed that Abraham had a God first family. And he was pleased with that kind of family, and he was able to use that family to do amazing things for his glory. And God can do that same kind of stuff today. Even today. Even in 2022, as wicked as our world is, God still takes notice of God first families. And he is pleased with those kinds of families, and he continues to use those kind of families to his glory and to his honor. And so as we get ready to wrap up this lesson, I'm going to ask you one more time. Do you have this kind of family? Do you have a God first family? Let me tell you something. You may not have a perfect family. In fact, you don't have a perfect family. I don't have a perfect family, 
No one in the Bible had a perfect family. Abraham didn't have a perfect family. Noah didn't have a perfect family. David didn't have a perfect family. Not even Jesus had a perfect family. While we do not have perfect families, you know what we can have? We can have God first families. We can have families that make God and his son Jesus the center of everything that they do. In fact, before having God first place in our families, you know, we really need, we need to first make sure God is first place in our lives. Remember, God was pleased with Abraham, not just because he put him first in his family, but also because he put him first in his life. And so this morning, if you sit there and realize that God is not first place in your life, it's time to start right there. Before you can help your family, you got to help yourself. You got to serve God. You got to obey the gospel. You have to believe in Jesus Christ, repent of your sins and put on Christ through baptism in water for forgiveness of sins. If you don't have God first place in your life right now, we're going to sing a song of invitation and we'll invite you to come to the front and we'll help you any way we can achieve that right here and right now today. Come to the front. Let's stand. Let's sing together.